once again appreciate being here at this meeting, uh, celebrating 25 years of being ordained with Brother Steve. We trust and pray that the Lord has blessed us in these last 25 years, that we have grown spiritually, that we've grown closer to him, and that you have as well. And we look forward to many more years, uh, as Brother Steve has mentioned, until the Lord comes again or until we're taken home, that we might continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Just uh, have been looking forward to this weekend with uh, great anticipation, and I believe that the Lord has blessed us this weekend as well. I did not realize that Brother Steve was going to also preach on a bird. Uh, as he talked about the sparrow, uh, I might should have saved the goose sermon for today. Uh, but uh, for those of you who heard the goose sermon yesterday, well, let's see how much you remember. Do you remember how to honk? Okay, very good. There you go. Appreciate that. That's wonderful. <clears throat> I'll begin this morning in the book of Exodus chapter 3. The day started out just like any other day. Moses got up and he knew that he had to take care of the sheep. He was tending the flocks of his father-in-law. And as he got up this day, he noticed that the sun was high. He noticed that the, the, uh, the ground was the same. He noticed that the flock was all there. And, and he began his routine just like he did on any other day. As he went about his business, Possibly uh, sometimes his mind reflected back to the first 40 years of his life, a 40-year period when he spent his first 40 years in the house of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, having been adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised as a prince of Egypt. He had access to things that others did not. He was raised in a bit of a privileged situation. And as he grew up in his teenage years, he had opportunities that others did not have. As he became a young man and grew up into a middle-aged man, then he was able to do things and go places that others were not able to do and they were not able to go. And then came that, that fateful day. We sang that song, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. It came that fateful day when he saw the Egyptian and the Israelite in a struggle, and he slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And then after that, seeing two Israelites having an argument, went up to them and thought that he might be able to be a peacemaker with them, but they just scoffed at him. They scorned him. And fearing that he might be afraid, uh, that he might be found out that he slew an Egyptian and the, the punishment that might come because of it, he, he fled Egypt and went into the wilderness where he met Jethro, married one of his daughters, and became a herder of sheep. And as Moses got up on this particular day, as I mentioned, it began just like any other day. He knew what he had to do. He had to make sure that the flock was taken care of. And we see here in chapter 3 of Exodus, that as he tended the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, he led the flock to the backside of the desert. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not so fond of being on the front side of the desert. And I question about leading a flock to the backside of the desert. But this is what Moses did. He led the flock to the backside of the desert. And as he was leading the flock there on the backside of the desert, he came to the mountain of God that was named Horeb. 
And as he came to that place, he looked over and there was a bush, a bush that no doubt he had seen many times before, a bush that to him was just like any other bush on any other day, except that that bush on this particular day was glowing. The scriptures record that it was a fire that was burning in the bush, and yet the bush was not consumed by the fire. Now Moses, as he saw this, he thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Never seen that before on the backside of the desert. I've never seen a bush before that was glowing with a fire. And yet, especially not being consumed by that fire. And Moses thought, I better go check this out. And as he did so, the Lord, it says in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see that God called to him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. Now, there were times in my life when I would uh, turn aside and do something that maybe I shouldn't do. And my mother would say, Michael Houston, this is what God is doing with Moses. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am I. Can you imagine what Moses was thinking as he saw this burning bush, as he saw this bush that was glowing with fire and yet not being consumed, and he thought, this is amazing. I have never seen a sight like this before. I've been on the backside of the desert now for many times in these 40 years that I've been tending the flocks of my father-in-law Jethro. I've seen bushes like this, and I've never seen a situation where a bush was on fire, and yet it was not being burnt up. And as he approached and heard his name being called out of a burning bush, now this isn't stuff that I'm just making up. It really happened. Here is Moses on the backside of the desert. There's a bush that's on fire, and it's not being burned up. And all of a sudden, the bush calls out his name. This is an interesting situation. Some of you, many of you, most of you are headed out to Cone, Texas here this evening. And while it's not really desert, it's a bit about like being on the backside of somewhere. And with the amazing heat that we've had here in this area in the last few weeks, you may think that the bushes are just going to pop up and get on fire. And if you see one on fire, and if you hear it call your name, you'll be thinking, this is an unusual situation. I've been coming to Harmony Plains for many years, and this has never happened before. Moses was like that on this day an interesting situation a bush that's on fire not being burned and not only that somebody is talking out of the burning bush this bush is talking and not only that it knows my name and all he can say is here I am it's like saying yeah what do you want this is an amazing situation and the bush then said these words, Draw not nigh hither. Brother Kenny talks a lot like that most every day, but for the rest of us, <laughs> what that means is, don't come any closer. I guess I should say being interpreted means, don't come any closer. And put off thy shoes from off thy feet. Take your shoes off, Moses. Don't come any closer and take your shoes off. Well, I know that there is someone here who can tell us by recent experience that 
going barefoot in the sand is not a good idea because it can hurt. And I would imagine Moses was thinking, I really, you know, they're just sandals. It's not like they're real shoes anyway. They haven't even invented the shoelace yet. But he takes his shoes off, and the voice says, I want you to do this, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Holy ground. Now, if I were Moses, I'd be looking around and saying, I'm on the backside of the desert. How could this be holy ground? I've come this way many times before. How could this be holy ground? This sand, this dirt right here, is just like that dirt and sand over yonder. How come this is holy ground and that's not holy ground over there? And that's the question that I would have. Now, would you all share with me that question for today? Why is this particular place holy ground? And if I can jump ahead for just a moment, Brother Steve has eloquently stated about how that the house of God is such a wonderful place. But let me ask you something. What makes this ground right here any different than that over there? or back yonder, or this way, what makes this place any different than any other ground? Now, don't jump ahead of me, brother. <laughs> That's exactly right, though, because the Lord's there. Moses is saying, this ground is just like any other. So what makes it holy? Let me take you back for just a moment to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, you recall, God created all kinds of things in, in uh, six days, right? I mean, he created the sun, he created the moon, he created the stars. One of my favorite aspects is he created light before he created the sun. That's one of my favorite parts of the creation story. He created light before he created the sun. He created the trees, he created the plants, he created the flowers. He created the birds. He created the, the animals that walk on the ground. He created the fish of the sea. He created creatures that we haven't even discovered yet. And unfortunately for those of you who will be in Cone next week, he created mosquitoes. <laughs> and as God was creating all of these things, at the very end, we know that God created Adam and Eve, he created mankind, and we are told that he created mankind from the dust of the earth. We don't see that, uh, that wording for any of the other creation, but he created mankind from the dust of the earth. That's important to remember. He created mankind from the dust of the earth, and he placed mankind in the Garden of Eden, and he dwelt with man there, and he fellowshiped with man there, and he provided for man there, and he gave them all kinds of things, and he just gave them one rule, right? One rule, he said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's all you've got to not do. You can do anything else you want to do, but just don't do that. And, of course, that's what we did, right? You leave your children, and you say, okay, you can go in any room of the house, and this is something that I might have heard as my youth. You can go in any room of the house, just don't go in the living room, right? That's back when we had the formal living room. We wanted the carpet to stay right and nice in there without any footprints, you know. Don't, don't take your food into there. Don't sit on the couch in there. We've got to have it just right, yeah. But you know what I did as a boy? I went through that room. I mean, I could go this way to go to the kitchen, or I could go this way to go to the kitchen, and this way was through the living room. That's the way I went, through the living room. One rule, and yet Adam and Eve could not keep that rule. And as a result, God came to Adam and Eve, and he said, what in the world have you done? And they didn't want to admit to it, but finally, you know, God, God knew already. And, you know, Adam, like uh, 
good husbands are supposed to do, blame the wife. <laughs> and, and then Eve, she blamed the serpent. And, of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> and God so told them that as a result, there was going to be a curse. There had never been a curse before in the earth. There was going to be a curse that came from that. And he said, he, he, uh, as a result of that, cursed is going to be the ground for thy sake, right? The ground, the dust of the earth, that very thing out of which we are made, the curse of God covered the ground. Now, since we're ground, right? Okay, we are ground. I'll just tell you, we are made out of dirt. We became cursed. The curse of God was upon humankind because of the sin and you know what he cursed the serpent too and you know what he said to the serpent all thy life you're going to slither around on your belly eating the dust of the earth and you know that satan continues even to this day <clears throat> to seek whom he may devour he is still today wanting to eat the dust of the earth that's you and me he continues to go about. Now, I know there's another verse that says like a roaring lion, but here we're talking about when, he, when uh, God cursed him and said, you're going to slither about and you're going to eat the dust of the earth. He is wanting to consume you. You and I are that dust. So here is this dust called Moses walking up to this burning bush, and the burning bush says, take your shoes off because where you are standing is holy ground. There was another situation where something similar occurred in the book of Joshua. Joshua is the one who took over leading the Israelites after Moses had passed away. And Joshua led the Israelites up to the River Jordan. And then you recall how that God miraculously parted the waters of the River Jordan and caused the water to stay up so that they could pass across. And they went across the River Jordan and um, got across into the Promised Land. And the nearest place that they, uh, city from where they were at that time, was a city called Jericho. And you know the whole story of Jericho and how that the Lord delivered Jericho in his hand. But before that, Joshua is going to scope out the situation. He goes all by himself up to look at Jericho. And as he, in chapter 5 of Joshua, approaches Jericho, it says that when Joshua was by Jericho, verse 13, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Now, again, this is not a figment of my imagination. This really happened. Here is Joshua going up. He's approaching Jericho, and as he does, he sees there somebody with a sword drawn in his hand. I know that would stop me in my tracks. And as he saw this man who stood with his sword drawn in his hand, instead of staying where he was, Joshua actually approached him, went up to him, and said, Are you for us? or for our adversaries. Well, I'll tell you, if I see a fellow with a sword in his hand, I'm going to assume he's not for me. I'm going to assume that there's some danger there. But Joshua, brave Joshua, goes up and he says, Whose side are you on? And the fellow says, No, I am come, I, I, I'm come as the captain of the host of the Lord. I'm not here to tell you which sides or whatever, but I am come as a representative of God. And Joshua fell down on his face and tried to worship him. And he said, What does my Lord say unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And we ask again, what was so amazing about this plot of ground 
where Joshua was standing at this time, why was it any different than the ground over there or to the left or, or behind or ahead? What was so amazing about this ground that it was holy ground? And you already know the answer. Because that is where the Lord chose to be. Wherever the Lord chooses to be, that is holy ground. So whether we are meeting in this place, or whether we are meeting in the Dallas area, or the San Antonio area, or some other state, or even if we are meeting in Cone, Texas, as long as the Lord is there, it is holy ground. You know, we've talked about geese, we've talked about sparrows, we've talked about these birds that fly up in the air. But now I guess I'm going to bring you back down to earth. And we're talking about dirt. Now, for those of you who live in this area, you know about dirt. You get to see dirt. You know, every other place that you would go, the dirt stays where it's supposed to stay. <laughs> but out here, dirt tries to be holy and tries to get closer to God. <laughs> and the Spirit of God makes it swirl and blow, and, and this has got to be holy ground. We know about dirt around here. And sometimes it becomes a nuisance. Sometimes it, be, you know, I, I was here the other week and, and sure enough, a dust storm blew up. And here we go, you know. What is it that is so special about the dirt? I'm reminded of when Jesus was one time approached by some Pharisees, and you can just imagine the Pharisees uh, marching in, and they, they have this woman with them. And this woman, they, they kind of set her down right there in the midst. Jesus was there teaching the people, and, and in marches the Pharisees, one after the other. And, and, uh, and by the way, they, uh, you know, it's kind of like cows. They, they know their pecking order. Uh, so the Pharisees did, too. And, and they, you know, the eldest to the youngest, they come marching in and they put this woman down right there in front of Jesus. Jesus is teaching uh, the people and, and they, as they put her there, throw her there in the midst uh, of, of all the people Jesus is teaching and they say unto Jesus, look, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. She was caught in a sin. There is no question about her guilt. Don't know why they didn't bring the man. But here she, here she was, she was caught in the very act, in the, she was a sinner, it was no doubt she was guilty, and they are trying to catch Jesus off guard. They said, well look Jesus, Moses said, Moses, he's the one who gave them the law, right? And Moses said in the law that this woman ought to be stoned, what do you say Jesus? What do you think about this situation Jesus? Are you going to disagree with what Moses said in the law? Are you going to disagree with what we have uh, been handed down uh, for, for generations as the law that came from God to Moses given to us? Are you going to disagree with Moses? Now, I'm sure that at that time, Jesus might have thought, don't talk to me about Moses. I was in the bush when he was on the backside of the desert. I talked to Moses myself. Don't tell me about Moses. You know, it's interesting what Jesus did. He's always so great. I mean, he, he is amazing in how he responds to these questions that are supposed to trip him up, you know. They tried to trick him all sorts of ways and get him to admit to things so that they could uh, say, oh, okay, I got you. But he never was, they were never able to do that gotcha on him, right? 
And Jesus, instead of debating and arguing with them, you know what he did? He kneels down and he starts drawing in the dirt. He starts writing in the dirt with his finger. The same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments on the two tablets of stone that were given to Moses, that Moses then broke and had to go back and get a second copy, that same finger started writing in the dirt. And I've often wondered about what was it you think that Jesus wrote in the dirt. We're not told in Scripture, so what I'm about to tell you is my opinion. It's not Scripture, okay? So you get that uh, uh, out there and out front. But I've wondered what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, does that make you curious? What did Jesus write in the dirt? And that's exactly what I thought that he wrote. You know how when you go into some restaurants, I haven't seen it that much anymore, and they have this, this tablecloth that's made out of paper, and your waiter or waitress will come up, and maybe they've got that talent where they can write upside down. Right? They're standing over here, you're over there, and they write upside down to them so that you can read it on your side. You ever experienced that? I imagine Jesus had that talent. And I mag- my imagination is, is that he wrote so that they could read it, each and every one of their besetting sins. What is the sin which does so easily beset you? You know, we're told to lay that sin aside. I would imagine that they, that Jesus wrote so that they could read it, each sin of each of one of the Pharisees. Isn't that great? I, I just have fun thinking about that. And Jesus, after he wrote that, he stood up and said, All right, the one that is without sin among you, you go pick up the first stone and throw it at her. And I would imagine <clears throat> that they saw what Jesus wrote, and again, I imagine it was their sins, and they would be condemned. You know, he knows what my sin is. I am not without sin. And do you, not, do you know what? Nobody, not one of them, went and got a rock. But each of them filed out. They then turned right around, did that U-turn, and in order, from the eldest down to the least, you know, to the youngest, they marched right out, and none of them threw a stone. Thus admitting themselves that they were also sinners condemned under the law. And you know what Jesus did after that? He bent back down, and I can imagine him erasing the dirt, right? The writing in the dirt. And he's going to talk to this woman. And what he's going to say unto this woman is, Woman, where are thine accusers? Who is it that's accusing you? And she says, Nobody's accusing me now. Right? And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 says the same thing. Who is accusing you? Who is it that is bringing you before God and saying, God, this person right here is a sinner and they deserve to die. They deserve to be banished to hell for all eternity. Who is it that's accusing you? And God says, as long as I am with you, nobody can accuse you. As long as you are covered by the grace of God, nobody can accuse you. You are no longer guilty. And Jesus essentially says that to this lady, neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. And he's writing in the dirt. And you know what I think he's writing this time? I think he's writing words like grace, mercy, love, forgiveness. And he's showing this lady, this woman who is a sinner, just like he has shown you in your lives right here, That even though you're a sinner, let me tell you about grace. Let me tell you about mercy. Let me tell you about love. Let me tell you about forgiveness. Let me tell you about how that I have saved you. And if you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, nobody has a right to condemn you. Not even Satan himself. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. That same dirt that was cursed, Jesus took his finger and he wrote in it 
Let me wipe away the sin and let me replace it with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. So, here we are. We're the dust of the earth. We have been condemned because of sin. We have been cursed because of sin. And yet, Jesus has wiped away the sins out of the dust of the earth and he has replaced it with his grace. Moses was said, Moses was told, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Joshua was told the same thing, take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. And let me tell you right now, if you want to kick off your shoes, that's fine with me. But let me tell you that you are on holy ground. Now, I'm not talking about the ground where this building is located. You walk around each and every day, even on the backside of the desert. You are walking around every day, no matter where you go, you are walking around on holy ground from the sole of your feet to the top of your head, you are holy ground because of what Jesus Christ has done. So that's right. Each and every one of you, you are divine dirt. You're the spiritual mud pie. You are the holy ground that God has come and dwelt within. And just like that bush that burned on the backside of the desert that was not consumed, the Holy Spirit of God, like the cloven tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost, have come down and dwelt within you. You have the Spirit of God within you. You have that holy fire of God within you. You have the glory of God that is shining, emanating out from you. And you're not consumed because it is God that burns within your soul. This is what we need to remember. Whether we are in some other state or some other country like the Philippines or wherever, no matter where we go, that burning bush is traveling with us. That burning bush flames us within. The glory of God shines and emanates from us. And no matter where we go, we are on holy ground. So take off your shoes. That was a way of showing respect. Show respect unto God. Show respect unto yourself because you are the temple of God, show respect unto God because you are that holy ground of God. May the Lord bless us to see this, to live this every day of our lives. Amen.